This week, I'm joined by Jordan. The PH is, of course, silent. We're going to talk about law and what's so interesting about it. And what do you need to focus on when running a world with that law? We'll also talk about why people seem to love learning about the law of made up worlds and why we got into D&D. Welcome to We Speak Common. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the D&D podcast for everyone because here we speak common. This is the show brought to you in partnership with The Dice Dungeon, your one-stop shop for everything you would need to play a game of Dungeons and & Dragons. And that's literal as well. I, I didn't realise this until quite recently, but you can literally get everything you need now from The Dice Dungeon, which is incredible. Uh, I know I talk about working with the guys for a long time, but it, I, I get a little swell of pride when I think about things like that. So of course you can get your wonderful premium D&D dice like uh, metal dice, resin dice, glass dice, they are very gorgeous and I have, um, I've actually got out my Kirill the Golden set to use this week which I haven't used in a while, I've been neglecting them for a, um, for a different set so go and check those out and remember that if you want to grab stuff from Dice Dungeon you can use the code we speak common on checkout to get yourself 10% off your entire order so everything in your basket get yourself some dice get yourself some DD books get yourself a dice rolling tray just to make that whole experience a little bit more premium and of course all the dice come with these wonderful tins which is wonderful uh, my favorite thing unless of course you're buying um bag of fates in which case you get a cool bag instead to uh, rip them open in of course, we're also brought to you in partnership with Describe. Describe is the place to go if you struggle with creative writing. Uh, if you are a DM or an aspiring DM, or maybe you're a player who really wants to, to run a game, you've got some ideas for a homebrew little thing in a, a, a town or a city or maybe even a country somewhere, but you're like, Ugh, I'm no good at describing stuff. Describe is the place to go. It's spelled D-S-C-R-Y-B. Put a .com on the end of there and it's a web address and you can go and check out their website. You've got professional creative writers describing places, spells, monsters and items with over three and a half thousand scenes already. And that grows every single week. If you can't write, they can and they've probably got something for you. And if they haven't, there'll be something really close that'll spark your imagination and get you going. Check them out. You can get a load of scenes for free already. But if you want to get access to everything, that growing range, all of the collections, then you can use the code COMMON for 10% off your monthly subscription for the first two years. It's 10% off. So go check that out too. For both of those guys, there is a link in the description below. And this week... It marks the end of our wonderful partnership with Obsidian Portal. Obsidian Portal are a really cool, unique service. If you've run a campaign on online over the last, let's face it, nearly two years because of lockdown, you'll know that it can be difficult to keep everything together, to have a place that feels like it's your area for your campaign. Obsidian Portal is just that. It's your corner of the internet. You can create wikis for NPCs, items and locations built into your own private campaign website that your players can get to. Or you can have it out in public for anyone to see. You can track your game with things that only you as the GM can see. And of course, your players can track all of their stuff on there too. It's your own personal D&D &D campaign website, Wikipedia tracking bonanza. Definitely have a look. Obsidian Portal is the place to go. And the reason they're supporting uh, this show and they have for the last uh, three weeks is because they've given me a one year Ascendant membership to give away to a lucky listener. Of course, we did the giveaway over on Twitter. Your last chance to enter was last week. And I can lovingly tell you that our winner for the giveaway for one year Ascendant membership to Obsidian Portal is Liam Harrison. That's at Goth Viking on Twitter. Liam is an absolute bro who I have seen uh, getting involved with Twitter uh, loads. So good to see that you've um, you've nabbed something, Liam. And uh, I'll get in contact with you pretty soon. All I need is your email address to chuck over to the guys at Obsidian Portal and they'll get you set up with a login and that year's membership. Use the power 
wisely and set up a fantastic campaign. No excuse not to play D&D this year now. Uh, of course, if you want to check out Obsidian Portal, um, then check the description below. I'll put a link in there. And uh, thanks to the guys for reaching out. Obsidian Portal reached out to me and said, do you want to, do you want to do something? We'd love to give something away. And they let me have a, a play around with their platform and really get to make sure that it was something that I thought you as our listeners would like to uh, to use. So it was a really cool, cool experience working with them. So it was wonderful. So Liam, use it well. Well done. Right, uh, I think with all of that said, the only other thing to say is that if you still want to get involved with the Patreon, you can, links in the description as ever, but if not, a reminder to share the podcast is the best way to support us. Of course, it's free content on the internet, so don't expect everybody to jump on the Patreon. But if you do, there are some things available, some cool supplements that I've created that you can grab, including now uh, my entry to the DM challenge, the Dungeon Masters challenge that happened for the D&D celebration this year. Uh, of course, I ended up to give it a go. Wasn't lucky enough to uh, get shortlisted through that first round. Uh, of course, they're only picking 10 people, and I know hundreds of people entered. So go and uh, grab that off the Patreon if you want. It's a trap called the Hall of the Damned Dead. It's nasty. I'm proud of it. I hope it will kill some players. Go and check that out if you're on the Patreon. And of course, you get access to the Discord server too. So by all means, jump in there as well. Okay. I think that's everything. Let's jump into this episode. A slightly different format this week because I had a wonderful guest join me, but we had a very short um, little window to sit and talk because our time zones were a bit weird. So it's in the middle of his work day. So the section you're hearing now and uh, the ad read in the middle are going to be recorded at a different time. But so, so this is future Ben, <laughs> which is fun. Um, so I can tell you that the conversation was wonderful and a lot of fun. I don't know why I'm being coy about it. You've seen the title of the episode, so you know who it is. Um, so Jordan, with the PH being silent, uh, it was an absolute pleasure to uh, to get him on and talk D&D and law and just how he got into it and what his favourite things are. So um, enjoy this. And as always, I'll leave his uh, links and things in the description below too so that you can find your way over to his content if you like the cut of his jib if you like what he's got to say i don't i don't want to say goodbye but i'll i'll tell you what past ben take over cool all right we'll um we'll jump straight into it then I always feel awkward starting these things. <laughs> I believe in you. <laughs> That's what I need to hear. I just need you to say that to me every week. Yeah. <laughs> a, a poster of uh, me hanging on. Oh a my tree god! Like, like hanging in there, like yeah, like on the washing line, like the kit, mm-hmm. the, the kitten. Yeah, that would yeah. be brilliant. Just on my wall. Cool. Okay, so <laughs> we'll just use that as the end. I like that. It's like a cold open. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, Welcome to uh, the the D and D podcast, for everyone. I was going to introduce you as the man with a name so complicated that it has a sentence after it. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Jordan with a silent ph in the middle. Uh, so it's it's written oddly, but uh, it you just say Jordan. It's just a regular great name. Where did the ph come from? I don't think I know that story. Um, it's, it's not an interesting story, but, uh, I worked (laughs) for a children's theater and we would teach classes on how to audition. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the classes we would do would have like a little sketch in it where my, uh, my tour partner and my, my other actor would be the person, the director auditioning. And I would pretend to be a kid coming in and I would hand him my resume and, and the auditioner would be like, Jorfton? And I was like, oh, no, the PH is silent. She's like, okay, well, that's not, that's odd, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, then uh, since then, I, I created a Twitter handle. And then I was trying to figure out uh, what to call myself online. And mm-hmm. I just, I didn't have a good idea. And, and then I was like, oh, that, that was a funny joke. Uh, but it, it was funny to like me and my friend. It's not really funny to anybody else. <laughs> And I like but it, I ran right. with it, and so now I'm now I just have this awkward online presence, but it's okay. I, I'm kind of stuck with it now. So 
I feel like they're the best though, aren't they? Like you, you if you've got a personable story to it, it's um it's always nice. It keeps you grounded. But <laughs> let's put it yeah, that way. yeah, yeah. I guess it's it's I don't know because I've seen uh, I actually I just watched a uh, interview with like Sly Flourish and mm. he was they were asking him like, well, where'd you come up with this name? And he's like, well, I was looking for something D and D ish, and it was just kind of like bland not bland mm-hmm. but just like very very calculated like this would be in search engines and and it's a D phrase and so i'm gonna go by that and stuff and i was like yeah. oh well mine's just mine's just dumb mine's a dumb story from 2009 <laughs> so <laughs> well, i i remember when um joe and i started off we speak common like three years ago we we spent ages trying to work out what we wanted to call it because originally we were like oh we just want to talk about D D like we just want to talk more because we don't play yeah. enough and we don't have any time to get any more games in so we'll just we'll just talk and if people want to listen to it they can and i remember like we f- we threw around so many different ideas of like because we wanted something that was vaguely D related like we wanted to be like yeah. oh, we've got a little D D show and uh, we came up with we speak common because we were like oh it's like a clever way of saying we're idiots because <laughs> everyone speaks common so that's <laughs> that's where ours came from and then like my like actual it. like name on online is just my name it's just oh yeah yeah i mean that works me and my middle initials because you know at this point there's no point trying to hide who i am on the, on the internet so um i always ask people this question i i've realized it started to throw a few people off what is your D D career where does D D start for you uh like when did it start or just like yeah like how like is it is it something you found when you were a wee boy or was it something you discovered later in life like oh yeah no i uh so i'm i'm currently 38 okay. and i think uh i was 30 when i played my first D D game um i was always interested in i read a lot of fantasy books as a kid and i was always interested in in uh fantasy in general mm. uh and video games like some of my favorite video games growing up were the Baldur's gate and neverwinter nights pc games so I always I knew that D and D was a thing, but I never I, I I never lived in a place that allowed me to play it because I was in a very small town in a rural part of America where it would probably be frowned upon to play, mm-hmm. and also there just was not the population density to find enough people that would be interested in something like that. So it it never really clicked for me to like consider playing Dungeons and Dragons or or any RPG for that matter. But I was always interested in theater. And in college, I was a theater major and doing a bunch of stuff. And I had some nerdy friends there that were playing a very complicated system called uh, Role Master, I think it was. And I mm-hmm. played a little bit of that, but I, I it never clicked because we were playing in the Lord of the Rings world, but I was specifically told that I can't do things that were in the book because it doesn't feel like a Tolkien world. So I, I would get excited and I'm like, oh, I want to like cast this fireball or I want to do this. And they're like, well, you can't really do that. And I'm like, uh, oh, because it just was, he want, the DM really wanted to keep it, you know, kind of Tolkien authentic, I guess. And you don't have Gandalf running around and yeah. spitting fireballs and stuff. So I get that. Uh, but yeah, so uh, many years later, uh, I'm in a play, um, and one of the one of my fellow actors, we were just talking about stuff, and he's like, "You've never played Dungeons and Dragons," and I was mm-hmm. like, "No," and he's like, "Man, you would love it!" Like he just he knew that it was something I would be interested in, and I was like, "Oh, really?" And he's like, "Yeah, let's I'll put a game together." So he gathered a bunch of of his friends and a couple of my friends and some people from the show and my uh my wife who was my girlfriend at the time and we all sat down and played second edition uh AD&D and I had never experienced anything like that before and it was so much fun mm. um and just uh I I like immediately went home and I I found PDFs and I found like an old book on uh eBay and I was reading them like religiously and I was like this is the coolest thing like, like he was right. Like, this is the coolest thing. Uh, and then that game fell apart real quick. And the guy that invited me to play, he ended up moving really quickly after that show ended. And so I was trying to find somebody else to like run games for me because I wanted to play. 
And then I realized that if I wanted to play more, I would need to run games. And so I went out and bought a bunch of fourth edition stuff and started running games. And I've literally been running them ever since. And then when fifth edition came out, we transitioned over to fifth edition and uh, and here I am. So, yeah, I, I've eight years only been playing uh, oh. RPGs, but it feels like I should have been playing it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th- I totally get that. I think I... It's quite fun. Whenever I ask people that question, I always get you always get so many different like versions of the story, but I've never found anyone that kind of lines up with my own experiences quite quite so closely. So I I'm a little bit younger, so I'm 24, and I'm obviously over in the UK, but it's like D and D's just not as big here. It's much bigger mm-hmm. now. Like I, there are so many people. Like there are people who I knew from like when I was you know like 10 years old, um, who I've bumped into like later on in life and they've been like oh i've, I've always wanted to try D and i'm like oh i have a podcast like D is my thing um, yeah <laughs> and and it's they're like oh, oh okay <laughs> but back in school like it was you, no one knew what it was and yeah. i have no idea where it came from because i was i was big into like i was a drama kid i was big into acting i wanted to be an actor and then i tr- transitioned away from that and got into uh being a radio presenter which is what i do now and so like i've always kept that kind of performancey kind of thing going and then somewhere along the line i discovered D and i still don't know where it was like i've always liked fantasy but i found it somewhere um so i think i've been playing now for about nine years i started about a year or so before fifth edition came out because okay, i remember yeah. one year like <laughs> i don't know there was i was listening to like the dragon talk podcast like mowing the lawn and they were talking about Rise of Tiamat. Like, I vividly remember that being one of my earliest D&D memories. But yeah, so I, I, I was very similar. I had to find people to convince to like, to play. Oh, my cat's come in and started meowing at me. Hey, Tabs. Oh, yeah. Hey, mine, hey, mine will probably do the same, but <laughs> yeah, you no, know, it's, it's so interesting. Uh, just, I don't know, like, yeah, D&D and, and uh, making that decision to being like, I'm, I'm going to run games because I, you want to play it that much, you know, and mm. I don't know. Nowadays I really like running games more than playing. Yeah. Uh, I'm the same. So. I was thinking that the other day, um, I was talking to, who was, I think, well, I think I was talking to Patrick from last week's episode, actually, and we were talking about our experiences and, um, similar conversation really, but I, yeah, I definitely find that DMing is now like the thing I get the most joy out of, which is never what I thought it would be either, which is really interesting yeah yeah like what um i don't know go ahead sorry (laughs) no no no, by all means oh no i was i was just thinking um uh even like writing a campaign can be like really rewarding but like i've i've run so many uh pre-made adventures and stuff and i i find just as much gratification out of doing that like i don't yeah i don't know what it is it's just like uh and then i was just telling somebody the other day that when I'm at the table and I'm a player, uh, I get bored sometimes because I'm just, I'm not as engaged because it's not your turn kind of a thing. But yeah. as a dungeon master, I'm always engaged and I'm trying to like listen and pull all these different conversations together somehow. And I don't know, there's a, it's it's way more work, but not in a bad way. Like I feel like I get more out of D&D as a dungeon master, so. Yeah, no, no, I totally get that. And I think, um, I, I, yeah, I, I feel that as well. Like some, there are times when I'm in a game and I'm like, hmm. I'm not sure if I'm I'm as engaged as I could be. And I had that conversation with someone recently and I said that I was so grateful that I found uh, a friend of mine, James, who he kind of, I think that we enjoy the same things in D&D and we both have an appreciation for like the same aspects of the game. So when he, he runs a game for me, I, I refer to him as my DM because I'm always engaged in his games, but then like, I could jump into someone else's game and it might just be a little bit off and I'm like, oh, I wish I was wish i was running a game right now yeah um, but yeah no and and like the thing about running pre-written adventures i've majority run pre-written adventures and i i love it i think it's one of the best things to do like taking a pre-written adventure and adding your own flair into it and mixing it around and, and you know mixing it into something else that you're running like i love doing that stuff and i think that i've never understood people who say that they, they don't like running them like at all point blank it's like there's so much stuff there that you can just take yeah, and I, use and have fun I've with. talked to people about it, and I think they have a preconceived notion. And I mean, this is a generalization, so I shouldn't really say this, but like, I think yeah. he, I think as a, oh, it's a pre-written adventure, uh, they have a preconceived notion that they have to follow it. And I was yeah. like, oh, no, like, I don't follow it at all. Like, 
I'm like, oh, you go left. Okay. And, you know, and I'll come up with stuff or I'll change things or, and then all of a sudden the mayor is the brother of somebody in the party. And you're like, yeah. what? And yeah. You know, it's like, I don't know. We just like, as we play the whole thing evolves and it's fun, but it's a great like jumping off point. And then I also know like, oh, here's a giant city you could go visit, you know, because it's in the adventure. So. Yeah. I, I always, the, the first thing I do after I've read an adventure is I rewrite the bits that I don't like and I change stuff around and then that becomes my new version of the adventure. And then that's the thing that I change from. Then I run from. Um, so yeah, I think like I, I always tell people whenever they, they say to me like, Oh, how do I run adventure? I'm like, you change it. Like it's there for you to do what you want with. That's always my biggest piece of advice, but that goes quite nicely into what I was going to ask, which was um, what got you into the law side of it? Cause obviously online you are one of the law men, in my opinion. I think I can't, I can't, it's a bit weird. I can't tell you how many hours of your videos I've seen. Um, <laughs> well, that's awesome. So <laughs> just because, well, yeah, it's it's a nice thing. Um, but just because I I love law as well, like I'll always just if I see a chance to get something in the back back of my brain and keep it there for another day, like I will. What got you into that? What was the draw there? I I've always loved law, so I have a really old a uh, Greek mythology book that uh, is it's basically a textbook and I would just read it and my friends are like what are you like and I'm like I don't know like it's cool like did you know this Orpheus guy like he lost his wife it's so sad and like <laughs> I don't know and so I've I've always really liked that and I like how stories can evolve and change um, and then reading things like Neil Gaiman's Sandman series where he did like a lot of stories that I grew up reading Greek mythology or Norse mythology or something, he would take a, take those and just kind of like, here's a Sandman twist on it. And I thought that was so interesting that you could just do that. You know, it's like public mm. domain. And and then we have a a shared uh, cultural experience where, you know, if I, if I talk about Zeus, like you might have a different interpretation of what Zeus is, but we still know what we're talking about. And we have this idea of these these gods that are not uh um, they're omnipotent but they're not like good you know they're just basically humans with a lot of power and so it's it's like well what what are those stories are how how are those stories told and what are they like so getting into dungeons and dragons i was trying to figure out how to run adventures and so i got some fourth edition adventures and then i looked at them and i'm like oh you're set in the forgotten realms and i'm like who's orcus so I start researching who Orcus is because I don't understand any of these. And then the more I was researching, I was like, oh, this is like actually taken from uh, mythology or public domain works that we have. And I thought that was kind of cool. And so, you know, like Asmodeus is a thing and, and Orcus is a thing and all this other stuff. So going from that um, and researching, I remember thinking like, man, I wish there was a YouTube channel like that would just kind of summarize things for me or like help me get a sense of what it is because it was a lot of tracking things down mm. and buying supplements. And I would buy entire PDFs of older material only to get maybe a paragraph of information. And I'm like, ah, like if I wish I wouldn't have bought this had I known that it was just a paragraph, like I wish this was somewhere else or, or just summarized for me in some way. Yeah. And I didn't find that on YouTube. Like I searched and I was like, well, you know, if I'm looking for this, I bet somebody else is looking for this. Uh, and so I just kind of started writing some scripts and it really was like me trying to figure out the Forgotten Realms, uh, which is complicated and, and <laughs> a, a, a complete mess of lore of like addition changes and like what is happening with it. Uh, and so yeah, that's where the, the channel came from. And then a lot of other people had like mind ideas. I, I started it in 2017. And yeah, I think a lot of other people were like, oh, like, I, I, I want to start a lore channel as well, because mm -hmm. me and AJ Pickett, and there was another guy named uh, Faerun History that mm -hmm. started a channel. And the three of us kind of started at the exact same time. We all had the exact same idea at the exact same time. <laughs> And it was like, oh, and then since then, there's been a lot of other channels. And uh, uh, you're probably familiar with Mr. Rex. And he he yeah. transitioned his like Skyrim lore channel to D&D. &D and and so, you know, there's there's people that are interested in it. And so uh, I was like, I don't know. It's like you, you find that niche that nobody else is doing and you dive in. So, yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. I like to imagine the like the pre YouTube lore days, because um, I think like I think when I was starting to get into it and just starting to get into D and D as a whole and was interested in like what's this and what does this mean and what's this thing that I found, um, I wasn't thinking to look on like YouTube and places like that yet. I was like, oh, I'm just gonna Google it <laughs> and see what comes yeah, up, yeah. or I'll flick through a book I own. Um, and I got to the point where I started to buy pdfs and things and i think i've got like a catalog of pdfs just stored away on like a cloud drive somewhere but it's like i like to imagine it as like the digital version of that guy in like raiders of the lost ark in the museum who has all of the papers oh. they're just like all coming out of tomes yeah. it's like it's like the modern day era version of that but for made up worlds <laughs> too <laughs> funny it's a lot of fun yeah it's, i remember cool. i remember uh I was at work listening to a YouTube video on World of Warcraft lore. And mm. I, I think it's because the World of Warcraft movie was coming out. And I, I have never played World of Warcraft. Like, I don't. I, I, I was just interested in this idea of, like, orcs and elves. Um, and then that was the day it, like, clicked. Where I'm like, oh my gosh, I could do this. But for, like, the Forgotten Realms. And, like, yeah, my early videos are awful. But uh, you <laughs> learn and you grow. And so. <laughs> yeah, someone told me that I, I've got a friend who listens to the podcast quite uh, regularly and he joined probably in like our second year or something when we'd kind of like and like th- we we had a good start we i was working in a radio station like frequently and we were using a proper studio because perks of the job but we were like still new to it and he he messaged me the other day and was like oh, i went back and listened to one of the old episodes recently it's not good oh yeah yeah <laughs> like, don't do no. that <laughs> of course it's not it's awful and like the first first one we did post lockdown as well like over the internet instead of being in a room together and like that would not i would not put that out today but oh yeah yeah just uh, like auto, oh my God. yeah audio quality and problems and yeah <laughs> yeah i think i think joe like didn't even have his microphone on properly or something like it was <laughs> such silly <laughs> things but um so do you how like i i don't know this might be true for you it's true for me sometimes i feel like i have my home game D brain where i'm like oh i'm gonna go and do some D D prep for my game on saturday night for example and then i have my oh that would be cool just to like put on the podcast brain and they're like two different entities or do you feel like it's just all you uh oh well, i don't know like usually what is going on in my game is either I, I i think it's like a two-way mirror like it's it's either a reflection of i'm i'm doing something in my game and i'm like oh my gosh this is so cool i want to make a video about it yeah or i've made a video about it and i'm like oh my gosh this is so cool i want to put it in my game so it kind of goes both ways i uh, i definitely as an as an early dungeon master i would have cool ideas and i would write down everything that kind of popped into my head and then i basically had really awesome players that would allow me to run whatever I wanted to. So I would, uh, like, we had a whole adventure that was uh, in the Underdark, and we had a whole adventure that was in the Shadowfell, and we had a whole adventure that was just in the desert, because I'm like, (laughs) I want to try out these desert mechanics. And they were game for a lot of it. But looking back on that, I I think I would definitely... Uh, rein myself in and mm-hmm. allow myself or allow my players to lead the the adventure more than me so yeah. and nowadays i kind of just follow like i don't know like wizards news like when they come out with new stuff i'm like okay like let's talk about this person or that person yeah um and yeah but like the lore aspect of it is kind of different than regular game prep i guess though but like definitely there there was a whole section where i was doing um uh i going back to the desert thing where i was talking a lot about the anorak desert and a bunch of other stuff and then i transitioned that into doing like a whole desert campaign with al uh mm-hmm. in my 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 homebrew setting so that's cool i yeah no i i i kind of follow that i think i had a point in my homebrew game or this is a few years ago and i was like oh i'm just gonna create a reason for me to be able to use pretty much any monster i want <laughs> and so yeah it's like, this... like that you're like yeah. i just want to use this cool monster so yeah it's like oh i want to get all of the toys out of my toy box and just drop them on the floor and see what happens 
Yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely, I remember doing that exact thing where I was thinking about uh, zombies and I'm like, I, I just want to do like a huge zombie apocalypse. And then that mm. worked into my desert game by a necromancer literally raising up like 500 one HP zombies. And how yes. do your players deal with 500 one HP zombies? And it's like, it was really interesting. It was fun, you know, because yeah, you can, you can do like, like the wizard and the cleric were having a blast because they'd run in and just do big AOE things. And then our poor fighters who were usually the, the stars of our campaign and did the most damage were just like, okay, I killed three. I'm like, yeah, that's real good. This, <laughs> this cleric got like 400 or 40, you know? Like, yeah. Oh. yeah, minions are great. I think I, I don't know if we've talked about this before. I think if we haven't done it in depth, it's probably an episode for the future, but I did a, a zombie thing um, midway through my Dragon Heist campaign, linking into, oh yeah, we had a, a Druid of the Spore, so we linked into him. And I like planned it all. I was like, oh yeah, this would be great. It'd be really cool. Like I seeded it like weeks in advance. And then it just so happened that the night, they like kicked it off and worked out what was going on and like the city of the dead was on lockdown was like the first session we did in lockdown in real life oh wow and i was like this is really awkward i did, did not plan it at all but we, we're here now we're just gonna we'll, we'll, we'll ride the wave and see what happens yeah, yeah. that was good fun Hello, it's Future Ben here uh, to talk about our wonderful partners. You know them, I know them, let's give them a moment of our time. Dice Dungeon are, of course, the partners who have been with us for well over a year now. Uh, ben and Dave are awesome guys, and they sell premium D&D dice, as well as D&D books, and now things like uh, dice rolling trays for when you buy metal dice and you don't want to dent your table, or you buy glass dice, because they're so pristine and beautiful and you don't want to chip them on your table. Uh, they also uh, sell other D&D uh, extras that you might want to get your hands on, like spell cards, things like that. And if, like me, you've got a lot of dice, but you want more, but you can't pick which set to get because there's so many, they do an awesome product called a Bag of Fates where you pay for a set of metal D&D dice. It's the cheapest way to buy D&D dice and you don't know which set you're going to get. It could be one of the sets on the website that you could buy straight out or it could be a mystery set that you can only get through Bag of Fates. So go and check those out too. They're really cool. We, uh, we being myself and Phoebe, got a bag each recently and of course they look the same so I let her pick the, the bag she wanted and I took the other one and she absolutely was luckier than me. <laughs> she got such a cool set my set was really cool too but hers had dragon scales on and i'm jealous i'm really jealous so i need to grab myself another bag of fates to try and get that set myself uh, go and check them out link in the description below of course they are uk based it's always great to support other uh, D tabletop uk based businesses and creators and things um so go and support them check them out and if you do buy something you can use the code we speak common to get 10 percent off your entire basket so everything in your basket uh, you can get money off okay uh our other partner partners are describe describe spelled d-s-c-r-y-b put dot com on the end for the website are the place to go if you're not great at doing creative writing i've been working recently on some homebrew stuff uh, my own campaign setting but also a little uh, mini adventure like a, a self-contained adventure that i've been working on and there are times when i'm like just pen to paper and I'm, and I'm happy with everything i'm writing and there are times when i just look at that page and i don't know how to describe the draco lich forming a new body in front of the adventurers so i have to go and get some inspiration describe are great for that they've got over three and a half thousand scenes describing places spells monsters and items they add to that every day and every single scene is written by professional creative writers people who do this stuff for a living professionally so uh, if you are struggling to get that description going then head over to the website link in the description below and check out a load of their free available scenes to get a taste if you like what you see you can subscribe for the full 
uh, the full over three and a half thousand, which of course grows every single week. I need to keep going back and checking the number. It's always bigger. Um, and you can get 10% off your subscription every single month. Doesn't matter which tier you take out uh, with um, the code common on checkout. And that's for two years. So you get 10% off every month for two years. So check that out too. Uh, and of course, this month, a special thanks to Obsidian Portal who allowed us to do a wonderful giveaway. Go and check those guys out as well if you're looking for a place to host your D&D campaigns on the internet with your own private Wikipedia. Uh, they're really cool as well. Um, yeah. Oh, it feels weird doing this separately. I'd <laughs> probably go back to normal next week. Um, it's difficult to uh, find find uh, the time when the time zones are a bit funny, but there we go. Uh, I'm going to take a chance to say as well here, because uh, I think I do a little plug at the end, but I didn't want to take up too much time because we Jordan and I were chatting away, that if you want to support the show, of course, the best ways to do it are directly via Patreon. There's a link through the description of that, which gives you access to the, the private Discord server, which is a wonderful community that's growing all the time. We're always chatting and having fun. Um, not just talking about D&D either, talking about lots of different things. Uh, but the other way, if you don't want to give money to the free content on the internet, totally understand, then the best thing you can do is share the podcast. I really want to try and get more people in this community, in this bubble. I've had so much fun meeting new people. Um, you know, not just like Jordan and Patrick from last week or, you know, uh, Wildforge from all, all the way back at the beginning. Not just other creators, but other just D&D and tabletop people. Just people that play the games and, and chat and enjoy this hobby. So... Um, if you know anyone who's not listening and you think that they'd enjoy the content and they'd enjoy having that kind of community, I want to meet them. I want to want to talk to people. Um, so please, that's the best way you can support. Just share the show with more, more D&D people. Cool. Uh, as ever, if you want to get in touch, Twitter, Instagram, all those things. And the email is we speak common at hotmail.com. Let me know what you've got going on in your games. Right. Back to then Jordan and past Ben. I'm getting the hang of this time travel stuff. Um, so how much lore do you put as part of your prep when you're... Like, maybe not from session to session because it's a bit focused in then but when you're prepping campaigns or you can pre you're prepping arcs and things how much prep time do you put into looking into law and building existing law in uh i mean that that always depends on the campaign and like where they're going so if i uh i so i ran a a, a longer campaign online because most of my games are offline like mm. i just like playing at my table with my friends yeah. Um, but I did I did run a game, Rod of Seven Parts, which is a classic second edition adventure that I updated to fifth edition. And it's also not set anywhere specifically, so I put it in the Forgotten Realms. And that was fun because, you know, my players would say, like, well, I think we need to go get information on what's happening. Let's go to Candlekeep. And so then I read a bunch about Candlekeep that week. Uh, and so it was like, where where is my party going? Um, but and then there was some like planner travel in that. So I did a bunch of uh, thinking about uh, various uh, planes of existence and adapting things. So to answer your question, I guess, now that I think about it, like a lot, like I, <laughs> I don't I don't purposely go out and say like, well, what kind of lore am I going to do or or what what's this? But when you have the ramifications of what your players are doing, I want to capitalize on that. So mm. when they delved into the plane of pandemonium, I did a lot of research on pandemonium that week and probably released a video or two on it. I don't remember, but <laughs> that uh, knowing all of that really helps when they land in pandemonium to be like, this is different than anything you've ever experienced. And here's why. And so, and then if they encounter people to ask like, well, what, what is happening here? Like, why is this the way it is? Well, you don't, you know, you don't know, but you can talk to this person and then the DM knows because he's read a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's a big geek. Um, I, I've got to take a sidetrack because you mentioned the Rod Sem parts and it's just sparked something in my brain. How, um, 
how difficult did you find updating that to fifth edition? Because that's something I've always wanted to do, specifically with that adventure, actually, and just never even like looked at it. I've just thought about it. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, it, I love that adventure, and I love the the history of it. With um, the Queen of Chaos is this evil Oberith demon that tried to destroy an entire race of people. Uh, and they crafted this magical rod to stop her general, Miska the Wolf Spider. And that rod, as it is, is, uh, is twofold. So I, I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of spoiling it, but I guess this is like a DM talk show. Oh, yeah, no, it's <laughs> fine. The, the rod, as it, as it quote unquote killed Miska the Wolf Spider in combat, part of Miska's essence went into the rod and the law versus chaos because demons are chaotic and these, mm. uh, these pe- race of people that I'm forgetting their names. It starts with a V. The Vistani. No, that's a different. That's Ravenloft. Yeah, anyway, that's Ravenloft. they uh, they built this rod, but they're very lawful. And so when the two met, the rod shattered into seven parts. And it's just one of those cool um, magic items because it's also a quest. You mm-hmm. know, you you have to like go find all of these different parts, and the rods are always pulling you in a certain direction. Updating it, I. I don't have any problems. Like a lot of people were like, how do you update this? And I think it goes back again to what we were talking about saying that there are people that are saying, well, I have to follow this guide exactly. And I'm like, you have a story in front of you, like just go with it. And so I knew that they would meet in a tavern and they would have a fight against uh, chaotic forces that are trying to get the rod of seven parts. And so I just flipped through my monster manual and I'm like, well, here's some cool demons. And I use those and it doesn't have to be the same monster at all. Mm. And in fact, the final fight against Miska, the wolf spider, I could have tried to update Miska from the second edition rules, but I ended up using a Theros monster from uh, Mythic Odysseys of Theros. Mm. And that just worked out really well. And I, I think I gave them like another great axe attack or something to make it a little more powerful, but they nobody nobody knows or cares so you just kind of use monsters that you have you know yeah i think it's funny because like i hearing you say it i'm like yeah this is this is right this is what i this is the advice i would want to be giving but i don't think about it anymore but like i don't so up to the point quite recently when i started running uh some spell jammer games which is like you know here's the law do what you want effectively because there's just nothing that kind of immediately translates over to fifth edition um, yeah i was like oh okay i just i, I need a i need a scraver for a, you know a, a cyclopsic shark that floats through space i'll just use a great shark or, or a giant shark and i'll give it an extra ability based on what the different colored scravers do and i'm sitting there as a dm thinking oh, it's just it's just the great it's just a giant shark like oh no what if it's not interesting enough my players are seeing in their brains a space shark with one eye that's giant and like really angry and is going to eat them so it it, it is a a thing of just getting over that worry that people are going to know your i don't know you feel like you're cheating a little bit yeah yeah i hear you yeah i i think the most difficult part of rod of seven parts just talking i mean because it is easy it is easy to reskin a monster like you were saying and you do kind of feel like you were cheating but the one thing that i knew mechanically had to work really well was the magic item that is the rod of many parts because Mm. every it's seven different parts and each part does something by itself and then when it's combined it does something more Mm. and so i was worried because you know hypothetically your players can combine parts one and two to create a a a mace or they could combine parts three and four to make a mace but if they combine all of those and so that that was complicated but um I I mean, I don't know. I think that was the hardest part of that whole adventure was just figuring out how to fifth edition eyes the magics in those uh in those rod fragments. Yeah. I was saying to Patrick last week actually that the because it's it's a bit weird over here. Like D&D's popular, but it's not popular, but it is popular or at least everybody kind of knows what it is and wants to try it but hasn't. It's like a weird kind of I feel like we're maybe th- four or five years behind where the US is. In, in terms like of popularity like, of yeah, yeah. Like, it's just, 
people know what it is or they've heard of it and every now and then you'll find someone who's who also plays it whereas my experience with meeting people i mean bear in mind that i'm talking to the echo chamber of the D side of the internet but my experience that i've heard from like americans is that like oh you know i, I can go to a secondhand bookshop and i might find an old D &D book <laughs> and like i have yeah, so much yeah. jealousy for that <laughs> just having yeah no there's chance. it's weird and actually that you bring it up i just went to a half price books which is like a secondhand store and found a, a bunch of rpgs that i was like there was like a 007 RPG and I'm like, oh, what? Wow. That was from the late eighties or something. And cause yeah, people are finding old stuff. Uh, I don't know. It's that, yeah, I, I, it's weird. I remember talking to a friend of a friend who found out that I played D and D and I would not have expected her to be interested in Dungeons and Dragons at all. And it's like this, like if I had asked her about it, two three years ago um it might have been like oh i've heard of D, D, but now she was approaching me and saying i want to be a dwarf and i'm like what like this is <laughs> like you have to run a game for me because i really want to try this out and it's it's that word of mouth and then i think a lot of people just start understanding that it is it's not i mean it's nerdy but it's not a weird basement thing like you yeah. you're just hanging out with friends and like honestly that's what i love most about it and that's another reason that i keep my in-game uh or my homebrew game at the table because i like just hanging out with my friends yeah yeah no i totally get that i actually used D, &D as an audition once for a um well it was kind of an audition it was like a it was like a radio thing but um it was in front of a panel of people it's like one of the weirdest things i've ever done in my career but we um you had to talk about something for like i think it was, a, it was either a minute or half a minute you just had to talk about something and you'd get rated on how well you like spoke and presented yourself. oh interesting <laughs> yeah it was really weird it was like oh if you've ever wanted to work in radio come and do this thing and i think they were looking for like presenters and things but it, it i don't know weird vibe anyway i talked about D and the one of the for lack of a better word judges Turn around and was like, oh yeah, I used to play D D in the eighties. I was like, great. Instantly realize I'm in without without meaning to. Because as soon as you find that person who knows what you're talking about, who has the experience, it's like, oh, you're instantly buddies, you've got a connection. Whereas if you don't know what D D is, it's like, oh, it's that thing with with dice and, and wizards, right? It's like, yeah, that's that that's kind of what it is. I mean, it's more than that. Ah, but, yeah. No, it's it's like it. uh <laughs> uh i taking my father to go see shakespeare and he's just like i what like there's what, what are they saying I'm like yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry and it's you know there's just a and i i think with D, &D as well there's that language barrier because you start dropping things like oh you know like in the realms and d8s mm -hmm. and da, da, and they're like i don't what is this language like what are you talking about so yeah yeah definitely it's like you know trying to I, what did i say last year it was like oh explaining thaco is like explaining the D, D equivalent of the offside rule which is yeah <laughs> probably the best analogy i've ever come up with and i think i'm going to use for the rest of my life now uh just a shame that thaco isn't relevant anymore um but yeah no i totally feel that so going back to law specifically um we were talking about using it in your world do you oh well, we were talking about prep but in terms of using it i feel like i have to have a decent understanding of a setting or at least like a, a good idea of the recent history or, or or how things work of a setting to make it feel that kind of lived in a live setting do you feel that way do you use law that way or do you have a different relationship with it at the table yeah i think i very similar um it it also kind of depends on my players Mm. uh or even the game system so i i have players that are they get very invested in the the background and things like that but i have other players that are they just want to go crawl through a dungeon kind of a thing um and then the lore will come up when they find uh a magical tiara or something and then i we have to explain like where this came from and or we, you don't have to but you can allude to it you know mm. um so, but I'm thinking back to it, last December, I ran, I, I tried to do a video every day for a month. Um, and I, 
talked about building your own campaign setting. And that was really insightful for me on the basis of like, well, where do you start? Like, how does magic work? Or like, what are the gods? Or how did the world begin? So if you're creating your own homebrew setting rather than just like stealing from the realms, which is completely legitimate, you should totally take mm-hmm. everything from the realms. Uh, I, For me, it's very important because I want to know where things come from and how things happen. And magic in the Forgotten Realms is very much like there's a magical weave. It's almost like the force and you you can somehow tap into it. But that's not Eberron. And that's not Ravenloft. There's not like a a force that you're tapping into. A, a lot of uh, like magic is really prevalent in Eberron. And then you think about other campaign settings. And magic is uh, something that you specifically really learn and hone. And it is a skill, much like a, a, a being a, an excellent swordsman. Like you have you have practiced this muscle. You've exercised it enough that it works. So I, I think it's really important to me personally, because in my homebrew setting, I was equating magic with like vibrations and uh, sacred geometry and things like that. And that's where magic circles would come from, because the the geometry of it and the vibrational frequency of this would create certain patterns. And I like that idea, but my players don't necessarily need to know that. But it's important for me to know how magic works, I think. Uh, and that's probably because I'm a big lore nut and I have always researched stuff like that and found it interesting. So, yeah, that's, I love that geometry magic connection. That's I've never thought of magic that way. That's really cool. I think I'm the same because I, I often find that if I like, if a player asks me a question and I don't know the answer, I then suddenly feel like I'm exposed and I'm like, Oh, I, I, I can't, give you the what you want and i can't like tell you the answer to this and i don't want to be like i need to go look that up i want to just be able to say it i don't know maybe maybe that's like the performer in me or not i don't know but i'm like i want to just be able to have it all there for you keep things flowing keep the story going and have that and i always say the illusion that i know everything and (laughs) i i I know that the world how the world's going to work and i plan for everything so that it feels like it's like this cohesive story rather than me going yeah I don't know. Yeah, because players will players will ask you like, "Hey, I'm I'm summoning a fireball. Like, is it coming from somewhere? Like, yeah. are these flames doing this? Like, they have questions that are usually related to the the like a combat or something. Mm. And then they want to know like, well, if the fire behaves like this, then I know that it could do X, Y, and Z. Um, and so it's important to know that you're like, no, you're you're heating up molecules in the air and that's how you're creating this fireball or something very different where it's like, no, you're opening a portal to the plane of fire Mm. and fire's just coming out. Uh, And so that has different ideas for how the players can like react to that. So, and I agree, like, I don't want to come up with those on the fly. And if I'm running a forgotten realms game, I want to know that like, Oh, the fire is happening because of these circumstances. Mm. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. And like, I got, I got to the point I don't know, I kind of, I feel like I've, I can look back over like, like stages of being a DM and like changing my style or just developing my style. But I got to a point where I was like, oh, okay, I know the law now. So now I'm going to, now I'm going to make things adjacent to it and add on to it and make like my version of the realms mm-hmm. because I've got games that, you know, run in it and they add to the history of, of my version of the realms. Um, and so like, for example, in our water deep, the Xanatha uh, is dead, and he is now within his mind shield ring on the finger of a player who took over the guild. <laughs> and nice. like he's he's in his brain all the time, like trying to trick him. And they've got this like kind of love hate relationship. It's great. So like my version of the realms instantly is very different to anyone else's because we've got stories that played in it. But like I got to the point where I was like, oh well, okay, well I know there's a knot in the weave, and and I know that it's. Like there's stuff going on in Undermountain and I know that, you know, Mm -hmm. X many years ago, there was that elven civilization. How does that mess up my players now? So now you've got a druid who has this weird connection to to demonic magic and it's like playing up and acting up because he's near the knot, for example. Um, Yeah. So it's like, okay, how do I now take the law that I know and build on it? And I think that's, that's like... Oh, I've reached my final form. I'm I am one with the law. <laughs> yeah. And now I can add to it. 
yeah. yeah that's that's being a dungeon master is like okay i'm i have a foundation and now i build on that foundation so yeah exactly uh, do you ever find i know you might not but do you ever find that it ever um boxes you in for things like if you're trying to come up with new stuff do you get boxed in by the stuff you already know that exists or does it help you creatively i no, it 100 percent helps me like i i i have people that send me lots of messages all the time mm. that's something like hey my player wants to do this but they can't because of these rules or because of this lore or i watched your video here and you said that that doesn't happen and i I just laugh and I also feel kind of sad. And I try to reply to a lot of those because I'm like, let your player, like, I don't know. A perfect example is uh, Moonblades. I did a video on Moonblades mm-hmm. and they're elven in nature and they have to like choose uh, to work with a specific elf. Um, and so you can't just like pick up a Moonblade and have all of its mighty powers, but instead the blade has to choose you. And my uh, like they they'll send me questions it's like well hey my player found a moon blade but they're human so can they use it because i don't think they can and i'm like well that's up to you but i mm-hmm. would let them like i mm-hmm. think that would be the coolest story like if you have a human walking into some elven compound with a moon blade and and they're wielding it like the blade chose that human the elves are going to be upset they're going to be like what's happening why is this guy special like that's a whole adventure so I look at I'm like, do it. And so I don't know. For me, it's it's never held me back because I'm I'm fine changing it. Like, who cares? You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I feel like there's um, and I could be very wrong now, which uh, here's me saying I like the illusion that I know everything. Um, I, I feel like there's a Moonblade in Dungeon of the Mad Mage, or at least there's something very similar. To that, I'm looking at the spine of the book imagine it's gonna like <laughs> give me the knowledge but it won't um yeah no. <laughs> but that is, that is work like that, i wish oh my god <laughs> i literally james i mentioned earlier he reads books so fast he lends me but like i'm reading the um i'm going through the drit series at the moment because i never read them and he is like 10 books ahead of me i don't know how people read that quickly it blows my mind like if i needed a super yeah, power, that's the one i'd go for <laughs> Yeah, I've got like borderline uh, uh, dyslexia, so my eyes dart around a lot when I'm reading, and mm-hmm. uh, I have to really focus to read. But I, I love to read; like, don't get me wrong. But like, I was always very jealous of. Uh, I have friends in college that would just absorb books so fast, and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, there are only words I could. <laughs> that like I just can't read. So I will, um, I'll read a book and I'll get to a word and <laughs> look at it for like five minutes then decide what it sounds like in my head and go with that and then if it comes up in conversation it's like the most embarrassing thing ever because it turns out i've been saying words wrong for my entire life but there we go oh no uh funny that's i have a great story for that my college friend i was playing skyrim or something and she's like oh that's a that's a cool necklace are you gonna equip that omelet and i'm like (laughs) what and this is one of my very intelligent friends that reads so much. And I'm like, I'm like, what the hell is an omelet? She's like that. It's an omelet. You know, sometimes they have like a, a symbol or like a picture in them or something like it's an. And I'm like, do you mean amulet? <laughs> and she's like, is that how you say it? I'm like, what? Like uh, Hermione, I can forgive kind of a thing because nobody knows how that's pronounced. But like amulet versus omelet. But she had never heard the word uh amulet and that's in her head and uh, you look at it and you're like yeah i guess you could call it that so that's amazing as well because i just think of the the breakfast food the omelet yeah exactly yeah Yeah, omelet no and i was like and that's what i thought of too i was like oh like eggs i was so confused but (laughs) that that is good my um mother half bless her she will never let me live down the fact that uh being a radio presenter you should know how to say the names of of the artists that you're playing songs of um and occasionally i w- I, u- I used to work on a station that played music from like all the way back from the 70s all the way up to like now real music variety was our was our tagline so cheesy uh but we played music from artists i'd never heard of before there's so many times i just said the names wrong and it's it i ne- never lived it down enter shakira was my my worst one because that was the band <laughs> i should have known um, of course, into Shikari, but yeah, 
It's all That's good. That's funny. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, I, I still haven't. It comes up at least once a month, I swear. But there we go. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time because I know you, I, I don't want to keep you for too long, but um, I think where I want to, uh, what would be a nice place to close then is when you are getting into, or you're getting to the point where you're like, okay, I need to look up some law. I need to know X, Y, Z about something. What are your pieces of advice for things to to look for or, or places to go and, and little nuggets that you, you see and go, oh, I'm going to keep that. That's something I'll use at a later date. How do you spot those things? Um, I mean, I, I search Wikipedia a lot for pieces of uh, lore, mythology. Mm. Um, and Wikipedia has a pretty extensive... Uh, database of lore i guess i was like it's wikipedia it's it has articles you read them um but uh so specifically uh going back to like sacred geometry and um i was trying to create some magic items and i would just type in like what are some mythological swords and wikipedia would say here's a whole bunch of mythological mythological swords from all of these different mythologies and then you could kind of go through and pick them and then you read up and the cool thing about wikipedia is a, a lot of the people there will put the links to where they uh are or or their reference things they'll say hey i got mm. this information from these pages or these documents or books or something and i spend a lot of time there like i'll read the article but it's really cool to go through and and pick little things uh from the books below and so it's like oh this sword is from norse mythology and it was in this book well then you like go look for that book and go to your library or something or find a pdf of it or or anything or buy it and then that's just a really fun read because it's going to have that information but it's also going to have a bunch of other inspiration for you mm. and you will you will learn stuff and and really enjoy the the process or at least i do so yeah yeah, I think if if you don't enjoy the process, then maybe let let John do it for you and watch his YouTube videos. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, because then the work's done for you. But if you yeah. do enjoy it, then you're in a world of your own, aren't you? Um, yeah. I always try and remember that thing of. I mean, you can say it in a number of different ways, but you know, every story's always been written, or there's no new idea, or or whatever. So don't feel bad if you look at something you go oh that's cool but it's already been done it's like well yeah but it's not been done by you before has it so yeah yeah and and people love uh bringing back stuff you know like all of a sudden if you're i really want to tell this like king arthur tale well then do it like people yeah it's been done to death but at the same time like people are familiar with that story and really enjoy things like that so cliches like, are a cliche for a reason yeah i don't know it's fun well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna let you go because I know you've got some stuff to do. But before we say goodbye, um, would you like to tell the people where you are on the internet and where they can find you and what you do? Uh, yeah. So I I'm Jordan with Silent Ph. That's J O R P H D A N, and you can find me at uh, J O R P H D A N dot com. I have a little website there that will link to most of the things I'm working on. Uh, but I'm primarily on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash J-O-R-P-H-D-A-N. And I do Forgotten Realms and other lore videos on campaign setting. So I have a whole Spelljammer playlist and I have a Ravenloft playlist and a big Forgotten Realms playlist. Hmm. Uh, recently, I started another YouTube channel called Jordan's Jocular Junction. And so you can search for that as well. Um, I don't have a short... Uh, address for that one but you can search it and you'll probably find it uh where i've been covering some um osr and indie rpg stuff that i really enjoy uh that are basically it's the site for non D D stuff when i wanted to talk about that so awesome nice one well thank you very much for joining me um as ever if you're listening to the podcast and you want to get involved uh, we speak common on twitter instagram all of the places you can support the show on patreon and if you want to send in any themes topics or a dnd agony aunt that is still open we speak common at hotmail.com if not on twitter is the place to go jordan thank you it's been an absolute pleasure um and you are welcome back anytime the the door oh, is always you. open yeah this was way fun uh, are you reaching out and everything this was great i'm really happy to come on and talk to you
Well, yeah, stuck with me now. I, I'm if you meet me, you talk to me once about D and D. That's it. We're friends for life. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's the rule. So like. yeah, yeah, we, we got to stick together. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, do us a favor and share us with a friend or a D and D group near you. If you'd like to directly support We Speak Common, you can by heading to the links in the description, either on this episode or via our social medias to find our Patreon. It's the best way to directly support the production of more shows like the one you listen to today. You can connect with the show on Twitter and Instagram at We Speak Common. The music in the episode is Street Dancing by Timecrawler82 and is held under a Creative Commons 4.0 license. You can find it on the Free Music Archive.